started. <laughs> Ten after one. Um, so last time, I forgot to have you make a copy of the file. That's what I started to say before. Got to have you make a copy of the file that we were working in. Um, and so if the files change with the same name, then um, Git is going to give you problems. So we have to do something right off the bat to just make that not happen. <laughs> so I'm going, I'm here, I'm on the terminal tab. And it's very, very slow. I'm on the terminal tab here. Um, and it's, that's, it's, it's a tab that lets me get straight to the Unix environment that's on the container. And so I'm just going to use, because I'm not actually sure how to do this within our studio, so I'm going to do it as command line, like I usually do. And uh, yeah, someday soon, the terminal prompt will come up, and I'll be able to do something. There we go. OK. So what I need you to do is type git, well, sorry, make sure that you are in this directory. So let me see the, OK. So if you can, can everybody see these little letters on Zoom? What? Um, yeah, I can try that. Yeah. All right. Okay. Now it's all like down there. Okay. There we go. What? No, that's not all the way down. <laughs> I knew this was going to be a pain if I did try to do this. Okay. Nope. Are you there? Oh, now it's just slow. Again. Okay, good. You know, I was using this though, like all morning, and there was no problem. Right? Some kind of firewall on the network here? Causing something? I think I'm on Duke Blue. Okay, I don't get I'm on the H1. I'm on the Gatsby. I'm on the Gatsby. Yeah, I'm on the Gatsby. Okay, hey, look, it finally responded now. Um, and so I just made sure that I was in my uh, home directory here. So if you, you should, should just say tilde with nothing after it. Um, and then I'm going to change directory into the workshop directory. Okay, so I need everybody to do this with me. Okay. So we're going to type CD. <laughs> Am I not in the It's not coming up. Hmm. I'm typing into the box and nothing is happening. Okay, this is like. Yeah. Is there other um, EGC nodes that we use? That they say hi, or is it just that one? Hi. Yeah, we used it about 10 years. Mm -hmm. so there should be like a direct network connection here somewhere. Oh, okay. But that doesn't help all the other people, right? Yeah. I, I'm thinking everybody else is really slow too, right? <laughs> Yeah, it's just yeah, it's just yeah. shows up there. Oh, and also I can't see Zoom on my screens here. I don't know why. Oh, that oh because you're not on. Oh, oh. <laughs> power. Okay. Yeah. Have you tried the power button, Jenny? No, <laughs> I did not. Perfect. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah, everybody's on Zoom too. It's, it's incredibly slow. Okay. Yeah, and this is like 
Um, yeah, this is a DCC issue. There's not a lot we can do about it unless DCC gets back to us. Yeah. Uh, trying to think of another class file that's class to start a few minutes. Okay. Yeah, I think we're 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 okay. I mean it's nothing you can do. It's yeah. <sighs> All right, wait, actually I'm getting it's somewhat responsive now. So if everybody can get to this point at least, I've got C D space twenty twenty four, and then I'm gonna hit the tab key and it will fill in the rest of the directory. Okay. And then I'm gonna hit enter and wait six months. Yeah. What should we do? I hate having everybody just kind of sit here. Like. Yeah, I'm looking at the other, like, you know, the one that you can give your uh, OIT that's just like super general. Yeah, the obtainer and a yeah. different partition. I'm wondering if that, I mean, why you that right now? Mm -hmm. I don't think you're using anything like any crazy packet or anything. I'm doing anything. <laughs> I don't even have Tidyverse loaded right now. Maybe I do. I don't know. Everyone would have to do like the kids calling and whatnot again. Yeah, that's um, that was the would they? Yeah. Maybe I don't. Know no, no, no. No, the, the file space is the, the file space your home directory. That's persistent. Oh, okay. that's fine. So, um, yeah. Okay. No idea. Um, All right. Let me just continue with this. Hopefully, we can at least get the. The, the repo poll. So I'm going to type git space stash, S T A S H. Let's see if I did that right. <laughs> I mean, one thing I could do is I could work locally on my computer, right. but then everybody wouldn't be able to. Have access to the to be able to follow me. Yeah. All those things. No, no, yeah. no, no, no. That sounds like a nightmare. Okay, so the command I wanted to execute from within the course materials directory on the container, I'm typing git space stash, and I will hit enter. And I have no local changes, but you guys will. <laughs> Oh, oh, maybe you didn't. Okay, that's good. If, if it says no local changes, that's fine. Um, if it, it might give you a whole bunch of um, verbiage, but as long as they got stashed or don't need to be stashed, it's fine. Okay. Um, people on Zoom, were you able to do the stash? Has it executed? Anybody still waiting for their container to actually work? Still waiting. Mine executed. Okay. Still waiting. So if it said it merged, that's fine. Said it merged? Mine says state open directory index state. That's probably fine. Let me see. Yeah. Okay, so I got a good here. I got a, a few I'm still waiting. Is anybody still waiting now? You can just put a hand up if you want. All right. I am still something we should do at the beginning of the uh, workshop session. Um, no, what we should do is we should make sure that we copy the notebooks into a different name each time we go in so that we don't we don't make changes to files that Git is tracking. Because if Git is tracking the file and you make local changes, then when you try to pull from 
the repository, you'll get an error because it'll say we can't merge your changes. And you don't have write permission. If you did, then Git would actually merge everything for you. It'd be fine. But you don't have that. So, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm really concerned about this performance. Okay. So I'm going to go into uh, the 2024-2025 HIV workshop. This is, seems to be working better for me now. I don't know. Yeah, this is actually responding. So and then lectures, and now I want to go into today's um, today's files. And the first one should be. Sorry, it may look different for people online. Um, it, for everyone else, when you pull, because I renamed last week's files to have them. But we haven't pulled yet, right? Yeah, yeah. to have them numerically yeah. line up. So actually, so we're first we're going to go to the upper right hand quadrant and click the blue pull arrow here. Oh, and I got all more 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 renamed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. And now it should look different in here too. I'm actually going to go back up one and then down to lectures again. Okay. There we go. And we that one got to be eleven now. Okay. So we want um, O no O five oh that's so we yeah. oh we have to fix that <laughs> okay yeah all right. <laughs> All right, another way to do it, we have stuff in there that needs that can be tracked by this. I don't think so. <laughs> and then you go back up the directory, put the whole directory there, and then go and clone it again. Okay. Uh, no, just, just type CD. All right, and now, uh, now you can just do RM, very careful command, RM space minus FR. That's that's force and recursive. So like you want to be very careful. Okay, next space. Now 2024. Okay. Yeah, and if you do 2024 and hit tab, it'll fill in the whole directory for you. Okay, and then you'll just go and do remember how to like go to the go to GitLab, get the clone thing, and yeah, and just do it again. Okay, did anybody have a hard time polling? Did any did it did everyone on Zoom have a successful poll? Okay, I'm not getting any messages, so I assume that's okay. Um working well, have trouble with poll. Okay, so what's the trouble with the poll that you had? Hi, Julie, what, what what error did you get? Can you type it in? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> hey, Richard, do you have any idea why Git Stash wouldn't work? I mean, this has uh, always worked in the past. I don't know. Okay. Uh, uh, you're going to message her? Okay, cool. All right. Uh, All right, Julie. Richard, Julie, do you have Teams, Microsoft Teams? You can just message her directly on the chat. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so it's a lot easier than going to a different platform, I would think. <sighs> okay. 
It's so much more fun when things work. All right, so we have a little bit. We still have to fix our, our naming conventions. Um, Rich has been trying to fix them for me, and then I go in and add new files, and it, it messes this numbering up. So um, we are looking at 05J4BaseGraphics.RMD. That's the file we want to be in. Okay, and I'm going to knit this and look at the HTML to begin with. Um, Oh, that's fun. Okay. I don't know why this is a problem. Yeah, that should that should be creating that file. I don't know why that's a problem. Um oh I know why it's actually a problem. Anyway. If you go to line 189 and uh, just comment out this little bit of code here, um, just comment out that chunk, and then it should knit. Or you don't actually need to knit it. I can just look at the HTML I have, and then we can I'll fix that later. OK, here we go. All right. so. Um, today I want to, um, we're going to cover ggplot2, um, which is a very, very powerful graphics package. Um, before we get through that, I'm going to show you some R graphics from the base R. So this is stuff that's been around probably since like, I don't know, the 1980s, 70s. <laughs> um, and, um, and it's, it's just, it, it's not as elegant as ggplot, but sometimes like when I want to see, like I said, Read in some data. If I just want a histogram or something like that, I'll just use the base R histogram because I just I'm just trying to get an idea of what the data look like, um, and you know scatter plots and things like that. You might want to do um, just from within base R without having to go through the whole like ggplot syntax. Um, so the I guess the the upside for base graphics is that the syntax is actually pretty succinct. It's not a lot of typing. Um, but the downside is that you don't get as nice plots, and, it and it's sort of cryptic. Like the, the commands are kind of, and you'll see what I mean when I say cryptic. Um, so here I'm just um, plotting the numbers 1 to 10 and 1 to 10. So 1 to 10 on the x-axis, first 1 to 10 on the y-axis, which is why I just get a straight line across here. So plot just takes a vector. The first vector you give it is the x coordinate. The second vector you get is the y coordinate, and then it will just create a plot. Um, we can change the symbols, and the way we change the symbols is using this um, what is P P C A? I think that's plot character. I'm not sure what it stands for. I think that's it. What does it stand for? Um, but so you don't have you can't. I don't think you could say triangle. Maybe they've changed that, but it's. So you have to just say, you have to know what the different numbers are corresponding to the symbols that you want. Um, and you need to specify them yourself. Um, and here I'm plotting um, 1 to 10, and I'm giving it um, the di so these are the different plots, so uh, the different characters. So um, one to PCH is equal to 1 to 10. So when it's one, it's a circle. When it's two, it's a diamond. When it's three, it's a plus. Four is cross, and so on and so forth. So these are the, the different um, the, the different symbols that you can have for a plot. And here I'm sure you can also um, you can color. So color one to ten. Um, it looks like so. It looks like it goes from black to red to green to blue to light blue to some kind of pink to yellow gray, and then back to black again. Um, you can add labels to the text. Um, so plot, yeah, text, text labels. So the plot command opens a plot, right? And so it puts the scatter plot there. If, if you, you can use these other like text and line and whatever to add to the plot that's open. So when I create a plot, it makes this, it, it makes it the plot with the x and y axis and the x's, and then I issue the text command and I'm saying I want to, um, for x, so x is 1 to 10 plus 1. So that's, that's kind of, it's moving everybody over 
just went a little bit to the to the right, and then printing out the um, the letters. So letters once letters is a is a known like vector in R um, that is um, letters in lowercase is the lowercase letters letters in uppercase yeah, letters. Okay, and then if I want to add a line plot. I can um, generate, so I'm just generating some random stuff here. So for, um, I want sample size is 20, um, X is from one to N, and then Y is just gonna be um, X plus the plus some noise, okay. Um, and then plotting X, Y, so that's the X coordinate, the Y coordinate, type is equal to L for line. LTY is um, the line type, which is one here. Um, other line types are going to be like could be dashes, dots, combinations of that, and they will have their own corresponding numeric code. Um, I think LWD is probably distant, um, and then the color is red. And I can give it a title. Main is equal to plot. X lab is equal to foo. Y is bar. And so we get. So you can see that you can within the plot command you have the enough commands. Uh, other um, sort of subcommands that allow you to decorate the plot however you want to. Put in a title, put in um, coordinate labels and such. And then I can add points to that. Um, so X, Y, um, and color equal blue. So the first plot, if I executed this one step at a time, the first plot would just be dots. Uh, sorry, the first plot would just be lines. And then the second, and then, and then I, I add sequentially plot points to it. Um, I'm going through this really quick. I don't expect you to like absorb the syntax or anything. I just want you to know that these are the things that are possible. Um, and really, if you ever want to do this, you would just go into the documentation and look it up because it's not something you've memorized until you're using it a million times and then you memorize it, you know, just because. Um, so, and I'm just reiterating here that. Um, Executing the plot command generates a new plot. So once, you, so I can keep adding like text and points and lines and whatever to a plot. And then, uh, but then once I say plot again, it starts over. Um, so here, M, this command here is just um, taking uh, Y and regressing, a linear, doing a linear regression um, Y over X, and then um, so this is what LM is for linear fit. And then I'm holding it in the, it returns an object called a fit object, and I'm storing that in M. So it's basically what, what LM is giving me back is essentially a list of things, and then I can pull things out of the list if I want. Um, and I can, um, I can, I want to show you that I, I can actually plot this line. So I, I've got the, um, the best fit line here in M, and um, I create a new plot. So I'm plotting a scatter plot, just X and Y, color is equal to blue, and then a B line gives me, uh, if I pass it M from the fit, it gives me the best fit line for this data. And I'm also telling it to color the line red, and that the line type is dashed. And I'm showing we can put multiple plots on the same axes. So again, M is our linear fit. Um, I'm plotting the blue and then putting the AB line, the dash. Now I create another, um, another Y vector. And this one is um, X plus R norm of 10 with a mean of 0 0.1. So it's a little bit different uh, normal noise that I'm adding to it. Do another linear fit and um, and then I will show, I can show the green lines. The green dots are, um, sorry, the green X's are from the new Y values. And the new line is orange. And it's, it's kind of, you can see it's kind of like on the same. It's hard to see, but they're, well, it's actually easier to see up here. There are two different lines here. So if I don't execute another plot command, it will keep the same plot and then add, I can add my new, new Y symbols and my new fit to it. Any questions so far? I should slow down. Is it good? Okay. All right. Um, and now we also like can do a histogram. And again, this is the thing that I usually use. Um, the, the, the one base R command uh, that I use a lot for graphics 
the test. Um, and you want to note that it's kind of why why does it look so weird? Uh, whatever. Okay, because this should be the new Y. This should be this should be this Y. I don't know why it looks so strange. Um, but and I'm just noting here, like just histogram of Y gives me this thing. But um, th there's a, an argument I can give you for breaks that adjusts the bin size on the histogram, and that will change often the shape of your plot. So whenever you look at histograms, you have to be careful because how you how you bin the data can really affect the, the visualization. That's a, that's a limitation of histograms. Um, and then you can do a bar plot. So that's just that's just taking the x value and then the, the y value that's associated with it. That, um, so this is a distribution. This is not. Um, and here, here's box plots. And to, to make the box, box plots, I'm just um, giving a um, I'm giving three, basically three um, ordinal variables. Oh, I'm sorry, not ordinal. What do I mean? <laughs> Richard, help me with the word. Like categorical. Thank you. That's the word. <laughs> three categorical variables, and then associated with it, with each of them is this um, is a normal um, some normal distribution, and you can see that um, that I then have those three bar plots for those guys, um, box plots. Um, you can do Q, QQ plots, which are quartile quartile plots, and that's where um, normally what you do is like um, if you're trying to compare something, see if something is normal or not, you um, plot the quartiles of the actual normal distribution versus the quartiles of your data, and you, if it's a, if it's a kind of like a y equal x line, then you're good. If it varies from the line, then you're uh, losing normality. Um, so um, this is just a histogram of X, which was just the, um, it's just generating um, 100 samples from a normal distribution with mean zero and center deviation one. And, and I plotted the histogram, looks a little better than the histogram before. Um, and then I can do a QQ plot. So, um, so QQ norm um, gives me the, the dots and then Q line of X gives me the, um, the actual Q line. Um, so what we what you can see here is that kind of like down in this part and up here and this basically the tails, you, you've got a little bit of deviation from normality. Um, but the point is that this is a built-in command in R. And if you're trying to look at, you know, quickly want to determine whether your data is normal, um, then you can you can make these plots very easily. Um, Here's another histogram. This is this one I'm generating from the gamma distribution, so I don't expect it to be normal at all. And here you can see how how bad that is um, because it's it's it wasn't generated from a normal distribution. Um, you can put multiple um, plots on a row using um, this command. Um, so you say par. <laughs> this is why it's like it's so. Um, I don't know, it's, the, the, it's so not obvious, like it's not intuitive, all of the commands here to me. Um, so this is like parameters, um, MF row, that means, so if I say uh, 2, 2, I'm gonna put, um, it's gonna be a two by two plot. So, so, so basically a matrix, a two by two matrix plot. Um, And then you can save plots, and I think what I did here is I didn't have, I don't have the SIGs directory underneath where I'm supposed to, so that's why it errored, so I commented that out. Um, and then I have some exercises for you to do, so you can play with this. Um, so again, using, using built-in data set, the, the um, IRIS data set, um, plot a scatter plot of pedal width versus pedal length, add a best fit line to the plot, create a box plot of, so, so basically do what I did, in these things with the IRS data set. I forgot about the sign-in sheet things. Did you guys sign, sign please sign in? Yeah.
So like six and seven, just don't do those um, because you don't have that directory. The big directory doesn't exist, and you'll get an error if you try. Is everybody about finished? Okay, so I'm just gonna go over one to four. Um, I actually don't remember how to do five, and it's not it's not actually worth it, I think, to even bother to try to do it, um, because GG fought so much better for that anyway. Um, okay, so the first one is just, yeah, you, you don't have to have the step where you assign values to X and Y, you put that into the plot command, but there it is. Um, number two, add the best fit line, so you do the, Plot again, and then you you have to do the um, you have to do the um, fit, and then um, pass that object into MB into AB line and add that to the plot, which should look something like that. Um, make a two by two plot. I actually also changed the changed the options on the chunk so that um, the figure width and figure height um, are a little bit better proportion because when I did it on the default, it was it looked terrible. So um, if yours looks terrible, you might want to try to play with that. And um, that's just species, X, X is species, Y is uh, um, pedal width. And then for the box plot, it's Y tilde X. So it's basically the outcome is Y, and you're going to iterate over X. Um, and that looks like this. And like this. Um, create a scatter plot of pedal width versus length and color or change symbol by species. Um, I actually just discovered, I didn't realize you had to do this. So um, species is a, is a, um, a factor. Um, so typically in R, um, when you deal with factors, externally it's showing you the, the string that's associated with a particular level of a factor, but internally R is labeling them one, two, three, and four. Like there are four different values. Um, but for this particular one, for color, it was fine to just do Irish dollar species. But for um, for the character, for some reason, I had to wrap it in as numeric, so it actually converted to the numeric, and so that I would get a different character for each species. And that plot looks like this. And then, yeah, add the best fit lines for each species. I can't remember how you have to do that. In, in ggplot, you just do, you just do it. <laughs> you just, you just just define the level of, of the the plot that you're making, and it, it it figures it out for you. So, not really worth to bother with that. Any questions? Okay, um, I was asked to give breaks and not make the breaks be part of doing problem sets. So um, let's take a 15 minute break now. Okay, let's get started again. Um, the next file we want to do is um, 06 day four graphics ggplot. And we're going to click on that. Open that up. And I bet I have the same issue with this folder as I did with the other one. Let me see. Probably also trying to write to the same directory that doesn't exist. So if you want to knit this so that it actually works, <laughs> um, you don't have to knit it. I'm going to just walk through the HTML so you can see it, but we should uh, comment out these GD save lines at 319 and 323, and probably also these. Um, well, those are, those are probably fine. Um, Mm 
There we go. Okay, so, oh, wait a minute. Oh, okay, it says our graphics, not. <laughs> no, I was expecting the title to say ggplot2, but it looks like but it's, it's here and not there. Okay, um, so um, we're gonna talk about what um, what is special about ggplot um, versus like this kind of like the bare bones stuff that you have in base R. Um, first, I'm going to um, just simulate some data so that we can, so that I can show you, just demonstrate to you. So it's just gonna work on simulated data. Um, so that's all this thing is doing. It's creating a table that has um, X, Y, and Z are numerics, and then G is a factor. Okay, and so what's special about ggplot? Well, GG stands for grammar of graphics. And um, it has, it's, it's, it's a really cool system that kind of builds from the base up and then you have add-ons, just like you did in our graphics where you had a plot and then you added on lines and things like that. Um, but it also uses the plus operator to add. So what you do, what you start out with is a data source. So that's gonna be a data frame or a tibble, works best with tibbles. Um, and then there's gonna be a mapping uh, you have to map data elements to visual characteristics, right? So um, what's on the x-axis, what's on the y-axis? And you do that via um, this function called AES, which stands for aesthetic. Um, and then you have different types of visual elements um, that are gonna be in the plot, and those are called geoms. So it starts with geom, geom point, geom line, geom histogram, geom box plot, and so forth. Um, and then you can add on to the plot add layers onto the plot using plus. So we did this in base R, right? We, we started out with points and then we added a line, for example. Um, but we didn't do, have this nice syntax where it actually just says, okay, here, put this layer on, put that layer on, put that layer on. Um, and you can fast it to automatically show group by plots. So, um, so you could, um, we could have taken those boss plots in, by species. It was plot length, uh, petal length and petal width. We could have fasted it by. Um, species, for example. Um, and then we can scale, and that controls how the AES mapping works. Um, so we can put things on a log scale, for example. Um, and then statistics will add summary data to the plot, and then themes just define the whole look and feel of the plot. Um, I don't use themes a lot, so I cover them in this thing, but it's not, it's not like one of the things that I'm like, uh, it's, not, it's not my specialty, so let's put it that way. Um, so the first thing we're going to do, so I'm creating a plot using the GD plot, and I'm going to store it in a, in, in, um, a variable called G, G0. So this, is, so this is what this is. Um, it, I take the data frame that I created, and I create an aesthetic. X is equal to X in the data frame, and Y is equal to Y in the data frame. And what you can see here when I print G0 is that there's nothing on the plot. Like when we said plot with the base our graphics, we got to scatter plot. Here, there's no default. All it does is it says, okay, what you told me was that you were going to plot this data frame and um, you want the X on the, on the horizontal axis and the Y variable on the, on the vertical axis. And now it knows because I gave it the data frame what the range is for each of those values but it doesn't put any kind of like graphics or anything onto the plot other than that. Okay, so if we want to actually see the data, we have to add a geom. So I gave it an aesthetic mapping already. It didn't tell it what I wanted on the plot. So now if I just say, oops, plus geom point, it will give me a scatter plot. Okay, where X is 
as it was defined. And I can, and I'm taking G0. So G0 has the aesthetic mapping and, and everything. G0 is this thing. And I can just take that object and add more onto it, creating G1. Okay. So then I ask anybody have any questions so far? Um, and now if I want to add more, I can, again, use the plus sign, and this is another geom, but geom smooth adds a smooth function to the, um, to the, to the plot, and it even gives you 95% confidence intervals in the shading here. Um, I told it I want a linear fit, but I also said that I want that to be a polynomial linear fit, linear fit which is why this is, um, but it's curved, so it's, it's fitting a quadratic. And that may sound confusing because I said it was linear, but when statistics, when we say linear, we mean linear in the coefficients. So we can have x squared in there as long as like the thing that's multiplying the x squared is, is, is linear, it's not a square. I hope that makes sense. Um, so this is how, so you, so you can just very easily add the signs. Remember before we had to do the, do the fit and then Pass the fit to this other function. Here, I just say, okay, just add this, please. Um, um, I can add another dimension by coloring. So now I'm going to color by z. Z is a continuous variable. So, um, so I get this, like, basically, a, what am I looking for? A spectrum, a spectrum of blues that defines uh, z. The value of z. So I've got x and y on the plot, and then I've got, and now I'm going to color by z. And it basically gives me another dimension to the plot. You can annotate using the labs function. So I can give it a title, subtitle, caption, x coordinate, y coordinate. I think there's even many more um, options you can give to labs that will create all these labels for you. And here it is. So ggplot2, graphics example, y-coordinate, x-coordinate, HIV workshop here in the caption. And so um, I find this really, um, it's just succinct to be able to like make a plot like this. Um, we can get rid of this color, so maybe I don't want the legend. There are times, and you'll see in the exercises, there are times we don't want the legend because it's just too complicated. Um, so I can use this um, guides. And it will say, I say call equal to false. So the color variable, and that comes from where? Yeah, that comes from here. So this color, it's saying, okay, I don't want, I don't want to see the guide for that. And so when I do that, it takes that away. And then themes. Themes are functions that affect the overall look. Um, so if I add theme minimal, which is, it's, it's, um, it's a built-in theme, um, to ggplot, you can, you can load other themes too. I believe there are, there are like packages that are themes and you can add those on too. I don't play a lot with these, um, cause I usually am not, I usually don't care that much what my plot looks like. I'm not generating reports. I'm like writing academic papers and yeah. Um, so. So this is the theme, this is the minimal theme. Uh, this is called line draw. And it's not exactly clear to me what's different here. Huh, does anybody see what's different between these two plots? Could be that somebody changed something. No, it's, I don't see any difference. All right, dark, I can see the difference. And, and you might want, like this actual, this actual plot does Highlight the, the the dark theme does kind of get you able to see this blues up here, um, and then we can so remember we had we had a um, categorical variable also in our data frame, so I can use I can um, I can facets to create parallel plots. So um, this is the plot for uh, g equal one, g equal two, three, and four. So and all I had to do to get that was add facet wrap, facet equal g, number of rows equal to. Um, then there's facet grid, which is not as easy to read, I think. 
Um, but it puts all, all of these um, into a row, in one row. And then scale. So we can scale. Um, what? Did I do any scaling there? I did not do any scaling here yet. OK, so I'm just creating G4. And that's going to have my data frame. I'm sending x to x, y to y, color is factor of g, um, adding points, adding a line, and then facet gridding on g and getting rid of the, um, what you will call it, getting rid of the guide. And so what I'm, what's different here is I'm, I've got, I'm coloring by the factor. So a lot, of, a lot of people who like sort of design these things would say that that's a bad thing to do um, because I'm adding color and it's not giving you any more information. You already have the information by blocking into four different plots. But I can't stand the way the black looks. <laughs> this is black and white stuff, but um, I think this is prettier, but, but it, you know, it is a fair criticism. And then we can actually scale the color scheme. Um, so this is uh, one of the color brewer things. So it's it's instead of giving like the different colors there, it's 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 giving um, different uh, shades, I guess, of this blue. Uh, this is a sequential it's called sequential because it's going. It's like the one before. It's shading like lighter to dark as you go from left to right. Um, but I can tell it palette equal reds instead of the default, which was, I guess, blue. Um, this is a qualitative uh, coloring. So, um, yeah. And then divergent. So divergent is, is a different kind of color scheme where um, I, I don't actually know why this goes from here to blue to green to whatever. I think it's just, it's not, it's not using the data or anything. It's just saying, oh, there are four different things. And I'm going to use this kind of like wave of a color, color thing. OK. Um, and this is just displaying all the different like color schemes that you can have in here. So if you want to go, it's um, our color brewer is the, um, or brewer is the name of the package that gives you all these different things. and if you want to display it, you use this code, and it shows you all of the, the different um, color schemes you can have. Again, I'm usually very happy to go with whatever the default is from GG Plot. But if you have if you have need to make more fancy plots, that's how you do it. Um, yeah, so I'm here. I'm scaling. All this is doing is scaling the, the, um, the y coordinate, I think. Oh, God, I have to come off. <laughs> yeah, so this is just giving me a log scale on the, on the y coordinate, so I'm actually doing the color, so I don't know what happens in here. Um, so these are the different geons. So we've already seen points before. Here's geom line. So again, the same data set, and I'm just adding, you know, either points or lines. So line just connects each sequential point. So that's why it looks all choppy like that. Um, I can also do a, de a density plot. So um, now I'm on the x-axis. I have the z coordinate. I'm filling by the different. Um, I'm filling the color by by g, the categorical variable. And then I'm giving giving a density. This alpha it just makes it adjusts how dense the color is. So if I made it very very big, um, I probably wouldn't be able to see the different plots because some of them would just go like they were opaque. So you want them to be somewhat transparent. Um, and I, guides alpha equals false. So that said, um, my legend would have given me alpha values. And um, I said, no, I just want the, I just want the, the categorical variable here. So that just says alpha equals false. Don't give me a guide for that particular variable. 
And this is a two geom density 2D. So this is a contour plot. So if you had, so we have X, Y, and Z. So I have the X, Y, and Z. So the Z coordinates are the, uh, are the, these are different values. Each line corresponds to a different Z value in the data frame. And then you can also put something, ah, I just went crazy. <laughs> Using my trackpad and it just kind of went um, And then you can have the, the rug that also like gives you an idea of like, the, the values of the. And so then geom bar, so those are two different kinds of like density plots that you can do. Uh, geom bar is gives me a um, just a bar graph. So x is equal to g. Um, and then I just have the sum of y is what these um, what these guys um, correspond to. So the y coordinates for each sum of the y coordinates for each value of g. That's what the bar plot gives me. Okay. And hold on a second. So this is weighting. Um, I shouldn't really take this part out. It's not really very interesting. Um, so I can I can give each of these aesthetics is G. The weight is the Y value, um, and then I'm giving a bar plot to that. So it will give me. Um, it's just weighting by the. I don't know. Okay, I don't remember what this does. So never mind. <laughs> Um, yeah, so this is how, this is getting, the bar plot is giving you a um, sum, but you have to, but it's it's doing it itself. Um, but if you already have counts, um, you can specify stat is equal to identity, and then it will actually give you the counts for each for that. This is just the y values, not sums of, of y values. And this is just showing you I've got a box plot. Um, X is G, Y is the Z coordinate, and I'm filling by G so that we get different colors for each of these. Again, redundant color scheme because it's just not giving me any new information. And then I'm in this jump jitter. Um, this is very useful if you have points that are close to each other that you wouldn't actually see individual points because they're kind of on top of each other. If you jitter them a little bit, it adds a little bit of noise to the points so you can see that they're you can see the separate ones. So like these would be really hard to kind of pull out if we didn't have to tease out if we didn't have that. Um, and again, I'm getting rid of the the legend for the fill color. Okay. Oh, and you can reduce it. I'm sorry, you can reduce the jitter. So here the width is equal to 0.2, and I can jitter a little bit less if I make it 0.1. So it's just how much about how much noise you're going to add. And here, if I wanted to, like, if I don't like seeing, if I don't like them lined up on the x-axis, I can add something called coordinate flip here, and that flips the, it rotates the plot so that the x-axis and the y-axis are interchanged. Um, and you'll see this, and you'll, I have some examples actually um, coming up where you where you can see why this is useful because if you have really big like large um, labels on the x-axis, for example, and you coordinate flip, then you can get, you have all of this space here in between to have your labels. And you can save plots using ggsave. Again, I forgot to create this directory in the new course, um, new course materials, so um, that's why I had to comment these out because I was getting an error. Um, and now I have a bunch of exercises for you um, to, to work with the iris data set, but after that, I have some HIV stuff for you to play with as well, and it gets a, it's a, lot, it's a bit more complicated, the HIV stuff. It's fun. Yeah, so scatter plots, deficit lines, all this, basically pretty much everything that you were asked to do in the last one, but do it with ggplot. And I forgot, don't forget to save the file. <laughs>
in a different name. All right, so the first one was to just create a scatter plot um, with the iris um, petal width versus petal length. So um, again, so I, I didn't, I guess I didn't demonstrate this in my slides so much, but um, you should be able to use the pipe symbol here too as well. So I take iris, I pipe it to ggplot, I define the aesthetics, x is the petal width, width, y is the petal length, and then just add on points. And there's the scatter plot. Um, to add a best fit line, all we have to do is say gm smooth and give it method equal lm. So in the example slides, I told it to use the method lm, and then I gave it a specific um, form for the function. Here, I'm just defaulting to um, taking the default, which is just the best fit line. I have a question about that. Yeah. Um, if you see the aesthetics, like you assign x and y within gm frames, like in the ggplot function, gm smooth won't know that, right? Like it will, you'll have to redefine it. Very good question. And yes, I should have pointed this out. When you define aesthetic in ggplot, that's for the whole plot. But you can redefine or define from within the geom, use the aesthetic, and that will be only for that particular, um, only for that particular um, geom. So yeah, and I did it actually did that with box plots. Okay. Um, all right, so that's with the best fit line. Um, create a box plot. So yeah, I said, I did, said to do these side by side, um, and there used to be a way of doing it. I think it changed. <laughs> um, so um, there's a couple things you can do here. One thing I did was I just did um, exactly what we were just saying. Um, I Instead of giving the aesthetics X and Y in ggplot, I did it in, on the individual box plot. And what that did for me was it, um, so that creates within the same plot, two different, um, two different sets of box plots, one for pedal length and one for pedal width. Um, and then just because it looks better, I also did a coordinate flip so that you can have your, so that you can see the three different species and then you have the pedal length and pedal width in the, in the box plots here, but they're not labeled, unfortunately. Um, there's better ways to do this plot. Another way to do it, and I didn't talk about this, but hopefully I'm gonna get time later to just kind of point out that um, ggplot is kind of like the, the basic, you know, gives you the, gives you the um, a wealth of commands to do things. But then there are packages on top of ggplot, like um, grid extra that allows you to place plots and um, basically and any kind of configuration that you like. So you can have like three plots on the left side and then two plots on the right, you know, so you can kind of arrange them on a page. Um, this cow plot is also good for arranging. So um, what I did was I made two different box plots, one for pedal width and one for pedal length. And then cow plot has a command called plot grid. And we'll put these things side by side. There's another package whose name is not, I'm not recalling right now, I have to look it up. Um, where it actually overloads the plus operator and the slash operator. So if you say P1 plus P2 plus P3, it will give you those across in, in a, across the page. If you say slash, it will stack them on top of each other. So you can use those operators to, to, to make, um, make your plots, uh, to arrange your plots on a page. Um, I think Thread Extra is a little bit more powerful because it gives, and it, it's more difficult to use, but it's, it's more powerful in that you can sort of scale your plot to and um, basically make any page that you, you would like. Um, but it, it's the learning curve is a little steeper. Um, the next one was create a scatter plot of pedal width versus pedal length and color or, or change the symbol by species. So here, if, if, you, if you put call equals species, then it would color by species. If you want different shapes, different, um, um, yeah, different uh, characters, then you use shape. And so here's, here's what it looks like with shape. So it takes dots for Setosa, triangle for Versicolor, and square for um, Virginica. Okay. Add best fit lines to, for each species to the plot. And what's really cool is because I define this as a plot aesthetic, um, 
it already knows that I want to kind of separate things by shape um, or species by species. So when I add the, the lines, it also um, gives me lines within species. So instead of having going over the entire data set, it actually breaks it up by species by, by the categorical variable. Um, and then I said save it again. That was the same problem. I don't have that anymore. Um, I, I don't have the directory there. I have to fix that. Um, and then, um, yeah, create a histogram of petal length and fill the bars by species. So I create a ggplot and then use the geom histogram. Um, and again, here I'm just I'm giving the aesthetics in the histogram. I could also have done them in the, in the overall plot. So because I'm only doing one thing, it doesn't actually matter where it is. And so I just say fill equals species, and there it is. Okay, and then create box plots of sepal width by species. Um, you just really have to give it some kind of separator here. You, you can use like either the shape or color or whatever. So I did color by species, and then it just it just breaks up uh, gives you one box plot for each species. Any questions? Can you show that last bit of code again? The last bit of code? Right yes, here. for the last example. Mm -hmm. right Any other questions? So in the bottom of this notebook, I have uh, another resource here that shows you some, oh, no, somehow I can't click on it here, so I'm just going to copy and paste it. Yeah, so this, this page gives a whole lot of um, ggplot examples and some really kind of cool composite charts. So basically, you can, you can find, and, and you can find lots of, people like love to play with ggplot, so you can find lots of sort of like blogs and data science blogs and things like that where they have all kinds of like really, really nice examples. Um, so, and that's using, and, and you'll see sometimes that, for example, here, it's doing a dendrogram, but it's not just ggplot on its own. You also have a library called ggdendro that works on top of ggplot and then gives you, like, you just give it, 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 it does all of the work for you, essentially. Like, if you were to try to do this yourself, and a ggplot, it would be probably a couple hundred lines of code, but you don't have to because they wrote the next function for you. Okay. So I'm going to say it's 3.06. Why don't we take another maybe five-minute break? People get up, walk around, whatever. Um, and then I have another example for you that's on using HIV data sets. All right, so I've got another um, another notebook for you guys that's got exercises in it. Um, and that is going to be, what is it now? <laughs> 07 Day 4 ggplot exercises. There it is. You shouldn't have the solutions one because I didn't push that. So let's open that file. What? Oh, my R Studio server decided to... Uh, 
It's been fine, but now I'm disconnected. <laughs> Did you? Um, I think that's just, I don't know. I, I don't know if that was like, if it just took the time like, to do it. Oh, look at that. It did want me to log back in. Oh, okay. Yeah, great. Okay, so if that happens, just refresh your page. <laughs> okay. So here's the one I want. I want. So it should be. Here it is. Oh seven day four GG flat exercises. Okay, uh, so we want to load the library tidyverse. Um, and then exercise one, I want you to read the file um, that is it's basically in it's in the um, the repo. So it's tilde is your home directory in this 2024. HIV workshop, data science, person doing so you need to like basically find this file and read it in. So uh, this is a combination, it's not just ggplot, but it's also a review of some of the dplyr stuff that we did and also other tidyverse things like read underscore CSV. Um, and then I want you to filter uh, only the age data into a tibble, drop the category column and rename group to age, basically just follow these and um, and you're so you're gonna read in the file and then you're going to do some manipulation, and then you're going to finally get to the point where you start to make plots and see what happens. Okay, how about we go start going over these because it's 20 to 4, and then we're going to want to um, do the survey at the end as well. So, um, okay. So the first part was just to read this in from the file. So hopefully, the, hopefully nobody gets stuck there. If you should, if you did, you should definitely have filled me. Um, so that's that um, that data frame. And remember, this is I showed you this. I think it was yeah, I think it was last session. Um, what this data frame looks like. Okay, where's my oh, okay, wake up mouse? Okay, so it's got uh, the year and some category. And then there's some grouping within the category, and there's a count. It's count of cases per year of HIV, people living with HIV or AIDS. Okay. And so I said I wanted, the first thing I asked you to do was select out um, only the age. So the fastest way to do this is using string detect um, on category and just look for age. So I don't have to look at age at year and the whole thing. I can just look for the string age. Um, and that gives me this data frame, but now I still have this category, which is redundant because it's all the same. Um, and then I have the group and count, so I asked you to rename the things. So we use the select command to get rid of category, year is year, and age is equal to group, and cases is equal to count. And that gives me this data frame, so it's year, age, and cases. And then I asked for a, um, a bar plot of um, on, uh, for age. And so when we do that, we see this, which is, let me actually make this a little smaller so we can see the whole plot. Okay. So when we do this, we see this weird thing where like greater than 75 gets put over here. And why is that? So it it's, it's alphabetical order. Yes, exactly. And so it just happens to be that this thing is in alphabetical order. So um, a great way to fix that, and I think the proper way to fix that, is what we really want these age to be. We don't want them to be character. We really want them to be uh, factors. So if we change that, it actually turns out that it interprets it properly. Um, so we mutate age is equal to as factor age column, and then so, and then save that back to the data frame. Execute it, and now you can see, when you look at the tibble, you can see the, that age is now a factor. And then if we do the same plot again, 
the order is correct. Um, if it still wasn't, um, then we could use uh, we could relevel the factor and and get it so get it to the where we where it actually logically should be. Um, and then I said do this by year, so that should be a facet wrap. So I'm going to facet wrap by year, and I get this, which is kind of ugly, right? The x-axis is all kind of mushed up. So what did you do for that? Exactly, coordinate flip. There we go. So do coordinate flip, and it actually looks pretty nice now. Um, there's also ways you can, so you see how like the, the numbers here are kind of bunched up? You can slant those. There's ways to add a slant to the, to the text. Um, okay, and then the next part was, what I asked you to do? Color by year, hold on. I should have answered these one at a time you know, so that I could actually keep track. Um, right, okay, so we did that. And then make one bar plot for each year. The display is suboptimal. We did that with chord flip. Uh, use the aesthetic mapping of year to color to break down by year in a single plot. Okay, so let's see what we did. First iteration. Go down more. Okay. Okay, let's, let's see what this looks like. So, what's wrong here? So, you see how everything's kind of on a shade of blue? Why is it doing that? It's seeing year as a continuous variable. Right, so so it's saying 200, 200, 2011 is, is like one year, and then it's just going kind of like it's, so it's shading it. It's shading it instead of blocking it. What I really want is I want to color by year. So I want 2011 to be one color, 2012 to be one color, right? Okay, so again, the fix is to put it as factor. Um, and then when we do that, That's more like what we wanted to see. Okay. And there's definitely a way to change this fill so that it's not so that it might be so that it's actually also colored, but I haven't figured out. I didn't take the time to do that. Um, and then again, I think it looks better if you flip the coordinates. Um, yeah, it's a lot better if you flip the coordinates here. Okay, and now I've got a second exercise that we're not going to take the time to do in class because it's quite a lot that I want to, I really want you to have time to still let you share it. Um, but this is reading in a different, um, a different file. Um, and then I ask you to work through some things. And it turns out, so, so basically I started playing with this and I was having a lot of fun because I was like, oh, here's a problem. And then I could, so, so this was sort of flow of consciousness the way that this worked out. Like I, I started like making plots and I was like, oh, but that's not what I wanted. How do I get what I, what get it to what I want to be? Oh, I have to make this age a factor or whatever. So um, I also wanted to do. I thought it would be fun to do a plot. Um, this particular file is on um, a study on adherence to art, and so there are people who actually do have like measurable viral loads because they aren't adhering to their to their medication protocol. And so um, they have measurements for viral load, and then they also have CD4 over time. And so I thought, wouldn't it be fun if we could see the viral load and the CD4 on the same plot with different y-axes, right, right and left? And so I looked up how to do that, and I found this 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 nice website, and I followed their thing, and I couldn't get it to work. So I'm giving it to you. <laughs> See if you could get it to work. I'll probably get obsessed with this at like 10 o'clock tonight and try to do it again. But um, yeah, but I thought I would give it to you. Just, it's, it's, even if you don't figure it out, it's good to think about these things and sort of like start reading and, and, and um, yeah, getting your hands dirty is the only way to really ever do any of this anyways. So, um, so I leave that for you, but, but, I, but with the caveat that I could not get number three to work. I, I, didn't, I probably only worked on it for about 20 minutes. So um, I'm, sure, I'm sure there's a solution. I just didn't find it in 20 minutes. Okay. All right. 
So that's all I have for this. Any questions at all? Especially now that you had time to kind of try to think these things through. No? Okay. All right. Well, then, um, let me find the... It is on the GitLab, right? I just have to find the right one. Okay. And then this is sign in, right? Oh, okay. Yep. There we go. Schedule. And the second one here. Okay. Yes. So please scan the QR code or just go here and click on the, um, the URL. And please do the post uh, class survey.